<clears throat> okay, Hans Holein, 1934-2014, and he was born on this day, uh, March 30th. So Hans Holein was an Austrian architect and designer and key figure of postmodern architecture. Well, actually, this this um, this uh, pre presentation from Wikipedia is not totally correct, and I will explain because I think he he transcended what is called postmodernism. Some of his most notable works are the Haas House, House uh, or House in German should be H A U S and the Albertina extension in the inner city of Vienna. Well, actually he has other works uh, at least as important uh, as this. This was the man, uh, apparently he was uh, ill for, uh, for uh, I read a long time, he died at 80 uh, and um, an interesting man. He, he studied both in Austria, at the, uh, the Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna, uh, which is a good school and it has a department in architecture as well. Then he studied in the United States. He also taught in the United States. He taught in, uh, in, uh, in Austria and I think in other countries as well. Um, <laughs> I like this picture very much. Uh, and uh, you know, he's probably in a hardware, uh, hard, hardware store because you see, I, all those, I see all those hammers. Uh, you know, on the, on, on the back. Anyway, maybe he owned a hardware store. I, I don't know. And here he is in, uh, in, uh, in his older age. Uh, and I'm sorry that he, he, he was ill uh, for a long time from what I read. Anyway, some drawings by Hans Hollein. Uh, and yes, it is true that, that he was very active and, uh, and uh, you know, influential uh, in, in that period of, of uh, at the end of the 20th century that we call today uh, postmodernism. But I think his architecture is uh, actually equally uh, modernistic. And uh, I actually think it transcends uh, easy categorizations. There are some elements, slight elements of what I, we might call uh, postmodernism, but they are very slight and very discreet. They do exist here and there, and I will point them out. Some drawings, I think he drew well, and um, you know, this drawing, we might uh, call it uh, visionary. Uh, and uh, yes, he drew manually. Uh, this is becoming uh, less uh, the case now because of the dig digital culture. Austrian culture is very, very interesting, and they do have, and did have, and will have great architects. Uh, truly, for a, for a country which is not uh, big, uh, it has the population of uh, half of the population of Romania, is uh, is is doing remarkably well in 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 in, in architecture and art. Uh, really, they they had great great architects, and they continue to produce great architecture. They have also great uh, architecture schools. Uh, in Innsbruck is a beautiful school now, which has a, an experimental uh, department. Uh, in Vienna, the Institute of Architecture, part of the Angewandte, the Academy of uh, uh, Applied Arts. And then the school where uh, Hans Hollein studied, uh, the Academy of Fine Arts. Um, I. I had the occasion to know a few students from the Academy of Fine Arts, and I even invited them uh, to, to our Erasmus uh, dorm uh, to talk with the students that, that came there, uh, came uh, to the summer school uh, two years ago. And uh, I have to say they are very, very uh, open to ideas, um, very, very uh, experimental in their works. For example, one of them uh, in, in, was doing his diploma. He was visiting Bucharest, and um, I invited him to give a lecture in Sala Frescelor, which he accepted, and he presented his diploma. And um, you know, the students asked him, uh, "Why did you use various um, digital techniques?" 
uh, you know, Maya, Houdini, uh, Revit, uh, 3D Max, uh, and so on. And he said, because every, every tool is important. Every tool has advantages and disadvantages. And uh, uh, the, the, the better equipped you are, the more you can defend your project. And so he was right. And I, I, I think, for example, at the Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna, uh, they study uh, digital um, uh, softwares, you know, the, the technologies from the second semester is, is mandatory, very, very, very intensely, 16 hours a day, every day because the digital language is like a foreign language. The sooner you learn it, the better you can, uh, you can, uh, you can uh, speak it, the, 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 the better you can use it. So the sooner you start and the more you, 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 um, um, you practice it, the better the chance to actually know it. So I wouldn't postpone at all to study <clears throat> the digital <clears throat> techniques they are crucial. Yes, Hans Hollein here drew a very nice drawing manually, uh, but uh, at the time when he made this drawing, there was no digital technology. It is good that you draw manually. It's, you shouldn't give up on that. It's good, but it's not enough. Not today. Today you need uh, to be very up to date with the newest technologies. Otherwise, you cannot uh, integrate yourselves in, uh, in, 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 the, in the common practice. Uh, and uh, uh, what is also important is to know that the computer is not just a tool that, that, that helps you materialize quicker and more rigorously what you can do otherwise, meaning manually. No. Uh, com a computer generated um, uh, solution, so to speak, or project is intrinsically different from one produced uh, uh, otherwise, let's say manually. Uh, the computer helps you to imagine an architecture which without it would be even impossible to imagine, not just to draw, but to imagine. Anyway, we're moving forward, we move, we move forward with Hans Hollein. And now we go to a work from 1964, 1965, a very little work, uh, small in terms of dimensions, but very significant, I would say, for architecture. And it was published extensively at that time in the 60s. It's a little store, but as opposed to the one on the right, this is architecturally, uh, uh, you know, uh, interesting, inciting. And, uh, you know, even within a very small space, you can produce something interesting. And you'll see next another store that he built in Vienna, also very small, but exquisite. Uh, so, you know, this was the 60s. Maybe the aesthetics of then are not the aesthetics of now. But this work shows that even within a single small room, you can make an architectural statement if you want to make it, and if you have something to say. I mean, again, neither this one nor this one say anything really architecturally. This one does. OK, maybe it's not, uh, you know, uh, you don't say wow necessarily, but, but it is a statement. It is an architectural statement. And you'll see a little store also a little store uh, later on, uh, which is uh, uh, remarkable. Also done by, uh, by Hans Hollein. Something else, an architect can do interior design quite well. Uh, there is no contradiction. Uh, you do the outside, you do the inside, you do even uh, uh, object design. You can do everything. This is a drawing I imagine by him. I, I put it here, but I don't know for sure it's by him. It's probably by him, and it's nice, I think. Anyway, uh, perspectival drawing, as you can see, quite a small space. Now, 
he crossed the ocean. He designed a gallery. I don't know how he obtained this commission. He was still very young in 1967, 1969, a gallery. I imagine of someone with connections in Austria. I don't know. Anyway, this one is a larger thing. Is this white building with these uh, impressive columns at the entrance. And uh, again, it is interior design, yes. But the interior design does belong to architecture. But this kind of curves were kind of in the air, although postmodernist per se began in, in, in you know, at uh, the end of the 70s or early 90s, uh, 90, uh, early 80s. This was done in the 60s. That's why I wouldn't really identify him with uh, postmodernism uh, per se. This is rather a modernism which questions certain things, less inhibited and less inhibiting. A uh, party in the gallery, it's always nice to uh, look a little bit at some, some glamour, why not? Now this store, this other store, uh, jewel, a jewelry store, a jewelry shop is one of his best works in my opinion. And it is one of the best works that Hans Hollein produced, although it is very small in terms of dimensions, because it is very creative formally, because it is indeed about the tale of the peacock, as uh, John Ruskin mentioned it, when he said that the most beautiful things are also the most useless. Look at this. You know, he broke, he broke the facade in a, in a capricious way, using a capricious form, and there's nothing wrong with it. In fact, it's the most exciting part of the building. Uh, you see, look at the door and look at this, you know, this ruining in a way of this, this, uh, this uh, erosion in the facade of the store M means a lot for the store. It's, 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 it's not a big thing, but it's, it's done very, very well, artistically provocative. And this is what architecture is about. Real, truly, this is what architecture is about. If someone asks, why did you do this? Of course, the architect could uh, whisper certain things, you know, but could also be silent because you cannot truly uh, objectify every decision that you make. Certain decisions you make, you know, uh, on the impulse of your instincts, your intuitions, uh, you just feel like doing something, you know, and uh, I understand the reason for, for uh, rational justifications, but I also understand, or I would understand architectural gestures done because you feel like doing them in a certain way. And, and if, if, if they are considered capricious, okay, let them be considered capricious. This is not capricious. It is capricious, but it is beautiful. Uh, without it, the store would not have been the same. Now, I don't know, there are these pipes, maybe maybe they help with the ventilation, but he created here an artwork on the facade. The facade became architecturally, uh, you know, uh, charged. Otherwise, the space is very small, uh, a little bigger than the other one, but still, it, it's a small, it's a small space. I mean, you see the size, you know, it's the width is probably less than three meters, about two meters and a half is a very narrow space. You see the dimension of the door, but it's a masterpiece. In my opinion, it is a masterpiece, uh, a section, <laughs> and truly, it's a very small room. I mean, look here, it's two meters and 11 centimeters here, the, the maximum of three meters. And here also, you know, two meters and something, certainly less than three meters. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And if, if something takes it out from the banality of the, of the deja vu, is exactly the most irrational, so to speak, part. This door and this thing. You know, and of course we can fantasize, you know, about what could what it could mean. 
but a, a, a great artwork and a great architecture is open to interpretations. So this one is open to interpretations right in, uh, in the center of Vienna. It is exquisite. And it connects in a way, you know, uh, obliquely with the Baroque culture of the city. Uh, it's nice and it's connect, it's connect, connects with other things as well, with the dualities of the, of the, of the, of the Viennese spirit in a way. The interior maybe is not so spectacular, but the, 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 the entrance door and the entrance into the space is. And somebody is photographing himself. I used to do this sort of thing myself in the window. I mean, reflected by the glass of the of the of the door. Now, could one explain this curvature in a rational way? Not really. It is drawn freely. It expresses an artistic decision that is. Uh, it could have been in a different way. He did it in this way because that's how he felt. That's how he drew it. Now, a museum from 1972 to 1982, he built several. This is a large museum. You see, when you are adventurous, when you are creative, when you are imaginative, your work stands out. If the work, you, if your work stands out, you receive commissions. If your work doesn't stand out, you are not going to receive commissions or you are going to receive very banal commissions. This is why I keep saying it is worth being adventurous, creative, imaginative, because the more you are so, the more your work will stand out. And if your work stands out, possible clients come to you instead of going to someone who doesn't stand out. It's normal. And it's, 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 uh, this is the case in every field, not just in architecture. So create original work, create creative work, be yourself, imaginative, do even crazy things. It's okay. If you feel them sincerely and intensely, it's fine. That's what MVRDV does in Rotterdam. That's what they do. And we give them as examples, but actually we don't follow them. We don't follow their, their way of doing things. And we should, if we are so, uh, uh, you know, uh, eager to give them as examples. I mean, uh, Hans Hollein could have done a building like this. No, he didn't. He did, uh, for his time, a uh, creative building. And it's true, uh, he has a tendency or had a tendency to extend the building beyond the limits of the building into the landscape. Like you see here, you know, all this part which he designed and is somehow announcing the museum and is somehow part of the museum, you know, like a long forward to a book that is, uh, you can't wait to read, so to speak. So it's an introduction, a spatial and a visual introduction to visiting the museum. A little bit hard to, to see what's going on here, but this is the museum. And uh, it is heterogeneous and it is hybrid. His architecture is indeed a, a hybrid architecture, although he has, you know, clearly defined squares here, but uh, he has all kinds of other shapes. This, you know, this side of his work, in my opinion, is a little bit too explicitly, you know, geometrical and regular, and he, he has this side. Sometimes it becomes a little bit too obvious, I would say. But I guess he wants guess... some... Pardon? I've heard the voice. If you want to say something, please do so. Otherwise, please be kind and turn off the microphone. What is remarkable about the work of, of Hans Hollein is that it's very... Um, 
I don't know how to say it's it's it's, um, it, it's, uh, it, it's, it's often a conglomerate of various things, and uh, it, it can be unexpected exactly because he uses a, a variety of, uh, of forms. And uh, yeah, it could be very surprising. You you'll see later on. I mean, even here, you see, uh, there are surprises. You look at this uh, part of the building, then this one, then uh, even this one, you know, they, there seems to be a level of incongruence, but uh, all in all, it is a work which has unity, but also has variety. He's rather free in, in his, uh, uh, and dogmatic. He's not, uh, you know, following, his, as opposed to Miss van der Rohe, for to speak, so to speak, who had a very clearly defined system. Hans Hollein is, uh, is uh, navigating between uh, various ways of doing architecture. And uh, it is difficult to pin down, actually. Now the interior, it is as it is, you know, a museum, it does have white walls. It's not very radical, it's true. And yes, it does have a touch of what might be called uh, postmodernism. But there are mysterious things here, like, you know, you don't quite know what's going on here and you are tempted to, uh, to explore. Now, the glass and ceramics house in Tehran in Iran, well, there was an existing building and he uh, created the, the interior design. So this was the existing building and uh, very courageously, the Iranians uh, commissioned Hans Hollein to, uh, you know, uh, create the, the interior design and uh, I'm, glad, I'm glad they did. There are all kinds of uh, inventions here. Actually, interior design can be very rewarding. And what is uh, nice about interior design is, is that usually the, the construction takes place uh, in a short time. And um, you, know, you don't have to wait for years, like in the case of a, of a new building. And uh, yeah, it, it could be very rewarding, actually. So Hans Hollein was known as, a, as, a, as an architect, but also as a designer. As you can see here, he is a designer. And uh, there is no contradiction, actually, between one and the other. Thomas Heatherwick, who is probably the most uh, intriguing uh, British architect today, and one of the most intriguing in the world, he's also a designer. He didn't even receive training as an architect. And he is doing uh, buildings which are, uh, you know, uh, very uh, audacious because he has more freedom. Because as a designer, trained as a designer, he sees th things differently. He doesn't have the restrictions which architects often uh, have. Those with a conventional architectural training, that's, that's what I'm trying to say. Anyway, this is a, a school from 1979 to 1990 in Vienna uh, by, um, by Hans Hollein, a nice lyrical drawing. And uh, this is the school, is here. And uh, in a difficult context in a way, because it's a narrow plot of land and you know, uh, there, are, there is an intersection to streets, it's an urban tissue. But he uh, managed to be uh, innovative and uh, playful uh, with certain parts of the building and uh, quite appropriately considering that this building uh, has at its main beneficiaries children. So it's supposed to be playful. And, you know, <laughs> I keep saying the ateliers in the university here should also be playful. 
because there, there are architecture students there, not soldiers, not, uh, I don't know, uh, blue collar workers working with, um, you know, uh, repetitive uh, machines or whatever, but architecture students change the design in every atelier when the school starts, please. You'll work differently in a different kind of atelier than, than in an atelier with a, with a, with the tables aligned as if uh, it's a, it's a military school. It shouldn't be a military school. It should be a creative school, highly creative. Anyway, I'm not saying that this building is uh, uh, remarkable. It has some interesting parts. And by the way, bring a ping pong table on the corridors at Minku. Yeah, and play ping pong uh, between, uh, you know, courses or yes, even, uh, you know, uh, some kind of other, you know, uh, roulette table or uh, a pool table or whatever, you know, playing is important. I, I knew I actually was invited once by uh, when they just uh, finished uh, their studies at Columbia University, the future partners in the very successful architecture office called SHOP, S-H-O-P in New York. And uh, they had a, a billiard table, how do you call it, a pool table uh, in their living room, you know, and, and uh, the, their playfulness is also shown in their works. And they build now unbelievable skyscrapers in Manhattan and not just skyscrapers. Please check out their works, SHOP, S-H-O, P and P stands for Pasquarelli, Greg Pasquarelli, who in 2018 was asked, what do you recommend uh, students in architecture? And he said, on one hand, history, philosophy, theory, and on the other hand, the newest digital technologies, scripting and programming. And I would agree with him. And I would say also with sadness that in both fields, we are not competitive. We are not well prepared at this point, neither in the field of sophisticated uh, softwares, nor truly in the field of theory, philosophy, history. History is studied to an extent, but in terms of theory and, uh, and um, you know, uh, theory, uh, in terms of theory and the philosophy, I don't think uh, we, 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 we are competitive. I remember last year, I know uh, in 2019, I invited, uh, well, a student, a Romanian student from uh, Milano was also participating. And in a discussion with, uh, with the students from Bucharest, I realized how much he knew about contemporary architecture of which our students knew nothing, nothing. I mean, this man knew it would be, you know, very, you know, certain details about a certain villa of Peter Eisenman, because, because in, in the school in Milan, they study very, very seriously contemporary architecture, you know, the most up-to-date architecture, and they read books, and they discuss, and so on, which you should do the same. Look at the plan of the, of, of the school. Now, the plan maybe, the plan maybe is a little bit nicer than, than the actual building, but, uh, what it shows is that you can be free. You can escape the, 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 the rectangular paradigm uh, if you feel like it, and only if you feel like it. Miss didn't feel like it, although he did have a project, if you remember, for a skyscraper which used curves kind of like here. But again, it depends. If your temperament sympathizes with the curvatures, sure, why not? If it doesn't, work with, you can do great architecture in a rectangular mode. You can also do a great architecture in a very different kind of, uh, uh, with, with very different kind of forms. But I actually like this part. This is the most interesting because it creates these, uh, you know, na narrow spaces and, uh, you know, they, they, they can be exciting and inciting for students. Otherwise, uh, you know, these parts of the buildings, they are a little bit too plain and too clean and too, I don't know. Anyway, uh, this is an apartment building in Berlin. Uh, I mentioned this before, Berlin had the wisdom to create in three different periods, uh, colonies 
of, uh, of, uh, of uh, important buildings built by important architects in 1930s, in the 1950s, and in the 1980s. This is from the 1980s, and this is what Hans Hollein, who was also invited, uh, built. This is the plan, uh, and um, you know the floor plan, and this is the you know the current current plan. The floor plan, uh, and the other one was the ground ground floor plan. Interesting plan, no? I mean, it's clear. It's uh, it's uh, you know very functional. Yes, you enter a vestibule, the bathroom. There are a little hallway here, and uh, the living room, and another room, and the kitchen, and another bedroom. It's fine. It, it's an apartment with two, two, uh, three rooms, two bedrooms, and one living room, and then um, you know, a balcony uh, or a loggia, and then here I don't know some kind of uh, extension of the of the of the room uh, outwardly. It's nice, and, and and there are four apartments here and the stair. That's it, and the lift, uh, an elevator. But there are small deviations from uh, rectangularity. You see here at the top, you see, so it's not, it's not completely straight. It's, and, and why not? You know, you, uh, certain differences are allowable. For example, this room is different from this room, although otherwise, you know, the apartment is kind of similar. Uh, no, actually there are five, five apartments. There is also this one with one with two rooms. So there are accidents, there are differences. But 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 I, I read in the in the program for the second year, uh, the university here that actually a certain flexibility and informality are advocated and encouraged. So break break the box, uh, you know, Hans Hollein did it in his own way without being outrageous. Someone said, uh, an architect who is very famous now in the United States and very, um, uh, you know, uh, yeah, uh, with a lot of success, builds a lot, Elizabeth Diller, she said, the trick is to be outrageous, but not offensive. Try to do the same in school, be outrageous, but not offensive. Unfortunately, it's not easy at all to do this. I myself fail many times because then when I when I when I am outrageous, I I I, I cannot uh, I cannot arrive at, at being uh, not offensive. But if you can be outrageous, but not offensive, I think uh, um, uh, you 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 could achieve very interesting things. Interesting things that might not even. Uh, uh, make the, the professors or who the jury is mad. But it's very difficult to know when to stop. But I, I still think it's important to be outrageous. Yes, to make something unseen, unheard of, you know, something new, something that represents you. This is the building. Now, I'm not saying it's a masterpiece, or but it's different from this building and from this building. And it has some interesting elements here. Maybe some of them, yes, belong to much of the 80s. In the 80s, indeed, it was postmodernism. Uh, and, uh, and this is kind of what we see here. But you see, the way he treats the wall here is different from the way he treats, not just chromatically. So again, why should they be identical? You know, a difference is important to be different, to make something different, even within a building, the same building. But yes, this building would qualify indeed for, for, for being so-called uh, uh, postmodern. Hello, this this canopy here is interesting, you know, uh, and it protects yes from the rain and so on. It, it has some interesting parts. This building. 
Now, this is uh, the Haas House in Vienna, which is very famous. It's right across the um, plaza from, uh, from St. Stephen's Cathedral. Uh, and uh, it's a commercial building, yes. And I think he's at his weakest when he uses these uh, stepped, uh, you know, squares. In my opinion, they are too predictable. And, but but it, it still has some interesting parts, the way these different kinds of forms, uh, um, you know, cooperate, uh, even conflictually somehow, towards uh, defining the building. It is a commercial building, it is true. And he was uh, courageous because he proposed a building that is not in conformity with the existing buildings. And this was, uh, you see the cathedral here. This is right at the heart of Vienna. And, uh, you know, he, he brought the new into a context which didn't have much of that new. So in that sense, he was uh, you know, courageous, adventurous. Outrageous to an extent, maybe. Uh, if, if we are to comment negatively, maybe yes, we could uh, comment on this, uh, you know, large glass wall. It is curved, but it is, I don't know, it's not glorious, nor this uh, stepped uh, part, I think. But, you know. That's what he did. He has better works, I think. And I think that the jewelry store uh, is, is a better work, although a much smaller work than this one. But this one is uh, has the prestige of, of its uh, position. Uh, the, the, the image, I think, is, is taken from the top of the, you know, the roof of the cathedral. Now, the Museum for Für Moderne Kunst in Frankfurt am Main is a museum of modern art, 1987-1991. Um, we have a, I don't know if you know, I'm talking with the Romanians, a Romanian architect who built something not very different, at least in terms of the, the urban context in, um, in Montreal. Uh, I'm talking about Dan Hanganu who is probably the best, um, if not known, but the best uh, acknowledged uh, Romanian architect overseas or, you know, uh, beyond the, the limits of the country. Uh, quite, uh, and that, that building in Montreal, and I, I suggest you, you take a look at it on the web, is uh, as an urban context and the site plan is, is very similar to this one by Hans Hollein. Otherwise, there are differences. And yes, it is, there, there are so-called postmodern elements here too. But look, there are delicious things as well, or mysterious. Look at this small window here and the way it is resolved. And uh, uh, not just the window, but um, I don't know. There is a, you know, something a little bit musical here or, or symphonic. Uh, he, he's, he was capable of surprises, you know, even this window here as opposed to this one or uh, those. And so it, it's a heterogeneous building. And this one is uh, even mysterious, you know, it's cultural. I don't know exactly what the function of these things is. I don't know what they are, but it, it does look provocative and engaging. So the richness of a building matters, does matter. If it is cultural, it, it has ornamental parts, if it has mysterious parts, it's very important to let your feeling be expressed in, in, in the building. It's very important, you know, to touch the heart first of yourself and then the heart of other people, as Le Corbusier actually explicitly uh, said. A good work of architecture is an emotional work. It is a work which touches the heart of those who use uh, it and, uh, and look at it and so on. I'm not saying that, you know, this building is, is, is giving you palpitations necessarily, but 
it has a certain level of, of, of richness. Even if the, the architectural language indeed it is um, recognizable as belonging to late 80s, early 90s. Interesting thing here, you know, you look at those uh, several uh, stairs, you know, all going in different directions from a central space. Frankfurt, Germany. Well, you know, the, the rooms within the museum, uh, is, they are in many museums, you know, with white walls, so you can hang artworks on them. He made a proposal for the Guggenheim Museum in Salzburg in Austria, but it was not built. Unfortunately, I'm not here. I, 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 I don't have the, quite the very explicit. I have pictures, but uh, I'm not very happy because I couldn't find the, the right pictures with, uh, with the plants and the sections being a project, but you'll get an idea. It has a significant portion of the building underground. And so it's, it's, it's a visceral kind of building. It's, it's mysterious, it's cave-like, uh, you know, uh, and it, it has a reference to the Frank Lloyd Wright Guggenheim in New York, you know, but it's, it's very different at the same time. So again, Hans Hollein was an uninhibited man and, uh, you know, he explored doing architecture in, uh, in uh, adventurous ways, like you can see in this section and look at the plan. To the students of the second year, but not only to them, I would say, apply what you do at the studio for me at, at the studio uh, in the atelier. Don't let them, the two activities uh, be, uh, you know, unconnected. No, that's why I, I, I will never understand why at studio for me, you can be playful with organic forms, but not at the atelier. It's absurd. Why are you studying the form in a certain way if you don't apply that study into the project? Anyway, here he is again, you see a lyrical uh, mentality at work, you know, he's, uh, he's uh, studying uh, work of architecture beyond the beloved greed of, uh, although Peter Eisenman himself turned against the greed, but he said that a project should always start with a grid. Well, I, I don't see too much of the grid here, certainly not in the section. So it's, it's more like a dispersion of various spaces, both above the ground and underground that creates this uh, hybrid uh, complex that was supposed to be the Guggenheim Museum in Salzburg. And look at the, this reminds me of the, of the cave that the students in Minku um, uh, realized for the Balul Bobocilor uh, two years ago or three years ago, and which was um, kept alive for only one day or two, when it could have been kept alive for as long as that paper that they created the cave with would have, uh, would have stood up. Uh, we are afraid of adventures, we are afraid of experiments, we are afraid of truth, actually, the inner truth of the students. We had to go very quickly back to the aligned equidistant tables. No more cave is dangerous. I mean, imagine the students doing a project in the cave, they would get wild, right? They would become outrageous. Okay, another museum in uh, St. Pölten in Austria, 1992-2002. Again, a big, uh, a big building. Uh, Hans Hollein did build some uh, significant structures. And even here you see hybridity. You know, uh, there are parts that are rectangular, there are parts that are, you know, uh, rebelliously sloping. Uh, this is the sketch. Uh, one of the sketches for this museum, and you see the duality here too. You see the 
you know, the rectangular part of the building and then you see something else. And this something else has its own importance. Is this canopy in this part of the building? The interior also is also almost uh, torturous, you know, and tortured is 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 uh, contorted, is tormented, is hybrid, is impure. Not here, it's true, but it has various kinds of spaces. It has the museum has this, but it also has this. You wonder, is it the same museum? But some something of, of, of bipolarity does exist in the Viennese uh, in the Viennese uh, culture, and the, you know uh, that there is uh, is maybe not an accident that uh, you know psychoanalysis was born there. You know, Doctor Freud was there. There are tensions, there are conflicts, there are dualities, and actually maybe because of them, the Austrian and the Viennese spirit is so. <clears throat> so alive and so uh, tensioned and uh, there is a lot of creativity that derives exactly from conflict and we are going to see i'm going to show you up after hans holine uh, wolf prix kop himmelblau and uh, Günther dominic because they belong somehow together with holine maybe was not so radical but also he he was um, uh, older uh, he worked in a different time somehow and uh, you know also had a different temperament but 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 what we see here it is rebelliousness all right and this kind of uh, radical uh, canopy uh, shows that the need he had for uh, uh, for uh, you know rebelliousness and we need rebelliousness is refreshing it is actually refreshing because rebelliousness gives reality to to that otherness that otherwise remains unexplored. Life has both order and disorder. And if art doesn't do this, what? So this is a museum of art. So it's supposed to be different. Well, it is not art per se, but artistic is the, 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 the display itself. This is a tower in Vienna from 1994 to 2000. Um, I don't know, personally, I'm not so moved by this work. Uh, is a tower, yes, it has some elements which uh, are um, disjunctive, uh, but um, all in all, uh, I don't think it's uh, one of his best works. Maybe he had difficulties to handle um, the program as a tower. Uh, who knows? The Austrian embassy in Berlin, a uh, building which is uh, surprising uh, considering the function, meaning uh, uh, an embassy, because it has a, a playfulness and it is almost a little bit burlesque, and you wouldn't expect something like this from a, from an embassy. But you know, and the colors, also the colors are a little bit. Um, when you, I mean, you know, who would use pink for uh, for an embassy? And even uh, you know uh, this color, you know, it's it's both colors are surprising for a, for a, for an embassy. But nothing wrong with surprises, I would say. This building also, I I, I would say that it it, it qualifies for being uh, associated with what we call postmodernism, unfortunately. Interbank headquarters in Lima in Peru, 1996 and 2000s. 
Uh, this, I think this work is not bad uh, for its function. It's a bank, yes, but it, it has a level of adventurousness. Uh, seen from the side even more, perhaps. Uh, sorry, this picture is not very, very clear, but this is the tower, obviously. And in the distance, here it is the work by Hans Hollein with some other towers by uh, other architects. But we see here also sculpturalness because without it, it's very hard. It's not impossible. Mies did it without it, but uh, other architects need it, need sculpturalness. He's very good at, and actually he uses this where there is an element which is um, standing out by itself. Uh, here there is uh, something, you know, where it is written the name of the bank. You will see at La Albertina a canopy which is dramatic and which in itself it represents that rebelli rebelliousness I, I mentioned. The rebelliousness here is, is represented by this element. The Centrum Bank in Liechtenstein. Um, this is an interesting bank also. Um, it has a certain degree of freedom. A look at the, uh, at the roof. You know, it's, it's almost a parametric surface here. But when he built it was not, uh, he didn't use uh, digital technologies. But you wonder why didn't he make the wall vertical or why didn't he make the roof flat? Well, does reality have only vertical walls and flat roofs? I don't think so. Reality is complex. And so levels of uh, capriciousness, if I can call them so, are necessary because they represent the, the, the unexpected that belongs to life. Now you see these surfaces, you know, they, they, in a way they connect, you know, someone could say, wait a minute, this is a rational explanation. It connects with the distant uh, mountains. Maybe, maybe that's why he did them like this. Although he did them also in Berlin in that uh, block of flats, which didn't have uh, that kind of mountains in the proximity. So what we see here is feeling, you know, the reason would have said, you know, this is the box. We have floors, the same height. Uh, you know, we use the same width of, of windows. But there is, there is the other thinking, you know, the intuitive thinking, the dark thinking in a way, the emotional thinking, which wants differences, you know, where you feel. He felt like doing this here. You know, and I don't think it's bad. You know, it's it's an uh, accent there that, that uh, expresses something. Otherwise, the building could have been just banal, like all other buildings. This is an interesting work of Volcania, European Center of Volcanology in Auvergne, uh, France, 1997-2002. Um, I don't know exactly the, the function of this space, but uh, there are interesting things here. And when you, when you reflect on what uh, a volcano is, somehow, you know, you feel tempted to, to, to find reasons for, for certain things. The plan is, uh, it has its own contortions and it is, uh, it's somewhere in between a cluster of buildings and a unitary building. It has uh, the dynamics of an urban place, although it is in essence one building. But if you look at this, you would say this is the fragment of a city. It's not a building. It's, uh, there are several buildings, part of a city. It's actually a building, but uh, you know, it's, it's a heterogeneous 
uh, complex. And I think it works. And he even uses, you know, various materials, stones, which in the case of a volcano, of course, uh, would be evocative. To have, <clears throat> to have surprises in a building is a good thing. It's a good thing to escape monotony. Nobody likes monotony. We like di differences. We like uh, accidents. We like things that, uh, that uh, you know, make us, uh, you know, feel alive and not dead. Only the dead doesn't move. The one who is alive moves to the left, to the right, uh, and so on, you know, so make a moving architecture, an architecture that is alive, that proclaims the richness of life and not, you know, a static, uh, you know, morose architecture. As uh, Charles Baudelaire would say, get drunk, on vous with uh, virtue, with poetry or with wine. Or I added, or I could add architecture, but get drunk. In other words, be imaginative, be, you know, creative, have temperament, uh, you know, express something vital in your work. Albertina Museum. I, I like this work very much. It's a very famous museum, but uh, he did just an extension. And what is uh, striking is this uh, element, the, the, the canopy. Look at this here. I mean, you know, again, this part, the functionalist would not totally understand because what, what is it covering and why? But in terms of emotion, in terms of symbolism, because this is a famous museum, this part is maybe the most significant part of his proposal of, of what, he, what he did. You know, all of a sudden this static museum a famous museum, but with a, an architecture that is rather static, all of a sudden is flying. And it's because of this, which, you know, it, it, it's capricious, you know, it could have been done in other ways. He did it in this way, but I think he did it very convincingly. I have been there and is a, it stands out the building because of that. And in a way, it's an art museum. They have great masterpieces of graphic art here. So this represents the exceptionalism of art. That's what it does. Wake up, passerby. We are talking about art, great art here. Present. But it's not a vulgar uh, publicity. Uh, it, it, is, uh, it is audacious. I would say, yes, it is uh, uh, outrageous, but not offensive. But it's very close of being offensive. If you try to, to, to read it in the context of all the other buildings, this is a, you know, a gesture of courage. And it's also black. But I think it's nice. I like it very much. Now, what would the functionally say? You know? What could he say? This is about emotion. It's not about function, really. But it's not, it's not frivolously without the fun. I mean, it is capricious, but it is, uh, it seems to be convincing. I don't know. I feel as if it needs to be there. And it is there. And Hans Hollein did it. How are we to assert our freedom if we don't do something like this? You know? I mean, really, we need freedom. I mean, without freedom, just like without love, what would life be? We need them. Be adventurous. Ah, the interior is not so adventurous. It's a restaurant. What can we say? You know, it's. I think he could have done a better job here, but maybe he didn't like this function or I don't know. Maybe being inside, I never went there, although I did go to Albertina um, 
I don't know, maybe it's fine. Maybe the experience as opposed to the photograph would be different. Okay, now an office building in Vienna, uh, this is not bad either, I think. It's, uh, yeah, it's a glass building, uh, but here again, we have the, you know, the, the this, uh, like in the case of Albertina, but less, um, you know, different dimensions, but it represents that part again, uh, you know, the, the a gesture towards uh, breaking the box or going beyond the limits. It's elegant, you know, look at the curvature of this facade and I think it's fine. I think it's a fine building and strangely, I, although I went to Vienna several times, I didn't see it or I, for some reason I didn't, uh, I didn't notice it because I, I just discovered this building. It's not even on the list uh, of, uh, on Wikipedia. I discovered it in the website of Hans Hollein. Uh, if you compare this building with this one, this one has grace, has movement, is elegant, is, is something else altogether, as opposed to this one. Okay, now an apartment, uh, I mean, there are several buildings actually, apartment buildings, apartment towers in Taiwan, in Taipei, 2004-2007. You know, it's like a society of, or a group of five people. Similar, uh, you know, with a height approximately the same, the silhouette is the same, they're all humans, but they're all different, you know, a little bit different, you know, so difference difference does matter i'm not saying they are exceptional towers maybe they are not but but they do represent a quest for individualizing them a little bit at least at the superior part you see each one is a little bit different they don't repeat each other completely in other words, there is a level of playfulness. And we need playfulness because it's a way th through which we achieve a certain degree of freedom. Another building in Lima, and this might be the last one that I show uh, from the works of uh, this one also has qualities, uh, you know, uh, it's kind of a tower, a medium sized tower, but uh, is able to, to, to not, not the interior. And again, this, this kind of stepping, I think, is rather predictable and rigid. But here there are some parts, and in fact, he kind of did this also in that building uh, across the plaza from. Uh, St. Stephen's Cathedral in Vienna. But the building, um, the building has, uh, has some parts here that, that are nice, you know, it's, it's this variation on the facade and various parts that, that um, you know, collaborate in order to create a whole, although they, they love their individuality. And I think it's nice, as opposed to this building here, this one has, uh, again, it's about playfulness and sculpturalness. Lima. The weak part, in my opinion, is this one, because it's, 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 it's a little bit too rational, it's too, you know, uh, yeah, predictable. I wish he, he got rid of this part. But again, I am subjective. Okay, thank you. And now, if you don't mind, I want to provoke you with an even more provocative work, also coming from Vienna, and that is um, um, the rebellious Vienna with Wolf Prix and Günther Dominik. And I think you like their works, and I hope they will make you also uh, wish to become very, very adventurous and to love what you do, because if you don't love what you do, the work leaks, uh, risks of not being, being loved by, either, by other people either. 
So it's important to um, uh, to uh, to be loved, um, and in order to be loved, you need to you need to do work that is lovely. Now let me just because I don't want to show everything. Just the rebellious uh, rebellious Vienna. And Vienna is a rebellious city, is capable of rebellion, and I love Vienna for this. It has is capable, it has convention, it has a bourgeois spirit, it was an imperial city, but it is also a city uh, that um, that um, experiments and is uh, is uh, really up there in the front in many respects. Rebellious Vienna. I start with Günther Domenig, an architect about whom you prob probably do not know much. Uh, this was Günther Domenig. He died, he died a few years ago. And uh, this is a sketch for his own house. We are going to see it. Um, other drawings he drew very, very well. And I, yes, I would include him in what I call, re what I call Rebellious Vienna. He drew manually, uh, very lyrically, almost romantically. But you see, organic drawing, visceral drawing, you know, uh, structures that uh, do not belong to the Cartesian grid at all. This is, <laughs> believe it or not, his own house, which he built during a good number of years. And a section I go kind of quickly because we already uh, spent some time with Hans Hollein and we have also to show uh, Kopp Himmelblau and Wolf Prix. What do we see here? We see conflict, we see tension, we see contradiction. And uh, uh, conflict uh, often uh, generates, uh, generates life. Uh, this is the house. It's a modern house. It's a, it was not associated per se with deconstructivism, but there are elements in his work that uh, do connect with what is called uh, deconstructivism. A model of the, of the house. Now it's a foundation there or a museum. He died, but it was his own house. Obviously, he said, Epate la bourgeoisie. He said uh, implicitly through his work, you know, <laughs> break the rules, break the regulations, uh, be free, express your truth, your own truth. This was his truth. Other people's truth might be different. This was his. Günther Domenig, you'll also see a bank he built in, uh, in Vienna, which would uh, surprise you as it surprised me. Now look at this house here. And look at this house here. <laughs> they, are, they are quite different, are they not? This is the bank, the Z bank he built in Vienna. It looks like a mask towards the outside, but you'll be astonished about what he did inside. And it was built uh, in the late 60s, early 70s. Uh, just a second, please. I had uh, I hate mobile phones and I hate w myself when I forget to, uh, you know, to hide them away. Anyway, sorry. So the Z Bank by Günther Domenic. Uh, unfortunately, the space was rented. Uh, it wasn't a bank any longer, and um, you know it was rented a space for a luggage store. But the the, the, the viscerality of the space is remarkable, and uh, you will see very soon. What I mean, look at this. This was supposed to be a bank and he built it like this. I mean, look at those pipes here and uh, look at that hand and look at here, look at the ceiling. It's remarkable that he was uh, allowed to, to build something like this. 
that's what I mean by rebellious Vienna. Things happen there. You know, uh, they do happen. And they do happen because, because there are architects with an artistic temperament who express themselves uh, with uh, audacity. Sorry about the luggage, but uh, you know, what can you do? They rented that space to an actually obnoxious uh, uh, shop owner who didn't allow us to, to visit. The, I, I visited it another time, but uh, they were terrible. Anyway, look at the ceiling, uh, look at the structure, look at the pipes. In a way, it represents angst, no? Uh, but, but, but angst is part of life, and certainly in Vienna as well. Otherwise, Dr. Freud would not have been very active there. So even a bank could be, again, sorry for the luggage, but uh, the interior was and is still remarkable with Gothic uh, elements and, uh, you know, technology also. Of course, they have nothing to do with these uh, annoying uh, pieces of luggage, but uh, let's look just at the architecture. I mean, even here, this is Gothicism in Vienna. The power of expression, it's important expression. And this is, uh, you know, the canopy that is at the entrance of the, of, of, of the, of the what used to be the bank. Uh, and now it changed function as, uh, again, it's not any longer. Uh, luggage store, it will be some kind of a hotel. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> so Günther Domenic in, in Vienna, the floor in front of the entrance into the building, the pavement now uh, um, uh, a building like a dining room for uh, nuns belonging to a certain religious order. I like this building very much. And, uh, you know, again, why should, uh, you know, uh, religious architecture reject or refuse, uh, um, you know, modern uh, architecture? It shouldn't. And this building is uh, a clear example that it works. It is cave-like. The inside is engaging outside, I think, is an interesting building. This is another building by Günther Domenic. Uh, now, you know, almost outrageous uh, cantilever part here. If I was inside the museum, I don't think I would have been in between these two, these people. I think I would have rather be here, been here. But that's because I'm not very courageous, although I uh, advocate courage. <laughs> This is very typical of someone who is not very courageous to, to uh, make, to publicize and, and uh, you know, uh, promote uh, courage. What, what one cannot do by himself or for himself uh, can certainly advocate to other people. Anyway, uh, but, but we see again here rebelliousness because this was the theme to show rebelliousness. What are all these things? They, are, they represent rebellion. A quest for freedom. Uh, this is another building by him, the uh, last one and a very large one, uh, uh, an office building uh, for a communication uh, company. And uh, you, all, you would have said, you, or you would almost say, this is by Zaha Hadid. It is not, it, it is by Günther Dominique. And you see the silhouette of Vienna here and all this building was designed by Dominique and together with a few other architects. Um, a city should be alive. And in fact, the, the, the program for the, for the project for the second year says the same thing. The problem is how to, how to, how to express this in the project. I think by being alive yourself, yourselves, uh, alive, yes, 
with your own truth. Just as Günther Domenic was, look at these diagonals here, look, you know, it, it, it's an engaging building. It's not a straight building, it's a complicated building. Here is the man, and I'm sorry, he died. And now we arrive at Kop Himmelblau and to Wolf Prix, who is a friend of the University in Bucharest. He is also a doctor honoris causa at Minku and um, he is one of the most adventurous architects today. This is an apartment building uh, not far away from the bus, international bus station, where a bus comes from Romania to Vienna. Uh, he built, they built, uh, you know, uh, three buildings here. This is one in the corner. It, this is not really structural. So there is a level of, uh, you know, maybe uh, questionable capriciousness, but the building stands out. I mean, you know, without this, which is essentially a mask, the building would have been much more uh, banal and, you know, quiet, but because of this, because yes, architecture has to have drama too. It has to be engaging. It has to bring something new out to, to provoke you, you know, to, to take you out of your own little box and, and, and make you feel alive. In essence, to, to conquer fear and timidity and so on. This building, so there are three buildings, this one here, this one, and this one. They, are, they, they were all built by, I mean, you know, designed, uh, projected uh, and built by uh, Kop Himmelblau and uh, the, the founder of the firm uh, is, um, and, and the leader is uh, Wolf Prix, a deconstructivist. He was part of the deconstructivist exhibition in, at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, together with uh, six other architects. Well, he was at that time also with his partner. He is not any longer in partnership with that architect. But Wolf Briggs did this, all this, and, uh, you know, they, they, I saw this building several times. I went with the students there and, you know, uh, the students from Minku don't appreciate it very much because it, you, here you see a fragment of, uh, you know, it connects with the history of the place with, a, I think, a previous, I don't know, it was a hospital there or something. And so, even if the building is adventurous and promotes the new, it also has affection and uh, respect. And this is a gesture of affection towards what preceded it and to the history of the place. And I think that was nice. Um, anyway, uh, the building, the third building that you saw in one of the pictures is this one is some kind of a convention center uh, or conference center. So you see the, the, the other, the building that we first saw was here. Then these are apartment. Uh, this is a block of flats with apartments. And then this building uh, is uh, with, um, I don't know, maybe apartments or offices, but also a Congress hall and, and so on. The colors are kind of uh, common to Vienna, uh, gray and some kind of a uh, reddish uh, pink. Uh, and um, so th there is also a gesture of connecting with a uh, chromatic uh, context of Vienna or a certain kind, a certain part of Vienna. On the back of this, you will see something very interesting. And in fact, when I discovered these buildings, I was biking through Vienna and I arrived at the back of this building without knowing it was designed by Kop Himmelblau, but it, 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 uh, it attracted my attention immediately and you are going to see why. When I go around this, uh, these buildings and I, I will go very soon. So again, this is an apartment uh, building. And it looks interesting because it is, it has the power of expression. It is cultural, it is uh, in, engaging, yeah, it is interesting, I think. Even if the morose, serious one would say, wait a minute, you know, this is not a real structure. And it's not, it's not. This is, you see, it's not supporting anything, but uh, I don't know. I, I still think it's, 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 it's fine. 
I mean, look at the alternative here. Would, would it would have been better? I doubt it. I mean, this is very static. This is not. And it's done really with not expensive materials, it's zinc. Now we, we arrive at uh, what I want to show you. So now we are on the other side of the building. And uh, this is uh, the middle portion of the, the three buildings. The one in the middle, an apartment building. But what I want to arrive at is, uh, is a spectacular uh, cantilever um, room here this one every time i went there with the students i asked them to you know to take a picture underneath is a is a, it's truly a dramatic cantilever uh, you don't see it yet here and also in terms of color because it's the redness of the room that is uh, opposite chromatically to the green of the trees and look at this it is a uh, uh, you know uh, it's just cantilever, it comes out. So talking about rebelliousness now, well, this is what rep it represents. It represents rebelliousness, not just through the form and the cantilever itself, but also through color. Vive la différence. It's about that, vive la différence. And it's conflict, it's tension you now between the trees and this thing that is cantilever um, this is another building. This one I'm not sure is by him, but I thought it might have been by him or by them. But even if it's not by them, I kind of like it. This addition of a narrow thing, you know, on the side of the existing building, this one. And also with the colors that uh, I told you can be can be find found sometimes in in, in Vienna. Now this building at the gasometer is a dorm for students, and uh, is uh, again a provocation, and uh, I think it works. I went there several times with uh, many students. And they all liked it, and especially this interstitial space between the existing massive building and the new one that they proposed. Here, there is magic in this dark, narrow uh, interstitial space. I hope I have pictures from there. I have an, uh, this presentation I have in various forms. This is a short uh, uh, version of, of the same presentation. So we see here uh, uh, the dialectics between the old and the new masonry, massive walls, and then uh, steel uh, structure and concrete. Uh, and there is the interplay, the dialectics between them, and it's fine. By the way, I want to say that uh, Wolf Brix is very, very, very fond of Brinkusch. He loves Brinkusch. He even thinks that he was the best artist of the 20th century. And he even made a proposal for a Brinkusch museum in Turgujiu. But I don't know if it will be built. Um, So again, this is a student uh, student's dorm. It's a dorm for the students. They also um, created a new interior for um, one of these massive cylinders. Jean Nouvel has one here too, and uh, two other architects. But this one was done by Kopp Himmelblau. 
Kop Himalbla, which is a play with words, which means kind of uh, like uh, uh, the co-op uh, blue sky. Because uh, Wolf Priggs and Kop Himmelblau believe in an almost a non-gravitational architecture. They want to make architecture fly. I've heard Wolf Priggs in a lecture at Columbia University in New York saying, we got rid of the third leg of the fourth leg. And now we are, we are attempting to get rid of the, of the, of the third leg. Uh, architecture traditionally had four legs. They got rid of the fourth. They also wanted to get rid of the third. Now, I don't know about that because uh, in this uh, process, you might also be tempted to get rid of the second leg. And then, um, anyway. By the way, Wolf Riggs was asked what five, are, five buildings are a must to be seen by any student of architecture and architect. And he said, the pyramids, meaning the Egyptian pyramids, the temple in Pestum, although he denied this when I confronted him, when I asked him, when he visited Bucharest, he said, no, no, I didn't say it, but I saw it published in an article from South Korea. So he said, the Egyptian pyramids, the Heras temple, temple in Pestum, uh, the Guggenheim Museum by Gary in, uh, in by Bilbao, the uh, a plane, he included a plane, maybe, I don't know, I, I, I forgot exactly which uh, model of a plane, let's say uh, Boeing 747. And then the fifth building, his own church in the little town where he was born in Austria for Martin Luther. And those uh, uh, very special contorted uh, roofing, uh, at least in, in, the most, in, the, in the, the most engaging visually part of the building, was actually drawn and modeled by a, by a former student in Minku, uh, in Bucharest, Daniel uh, Bojanaro, I think is his name. And he works for uh, Kop Himmelblau and for um, uh, Wolf Prix. an expert in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in softwares and high technology and digital uh, uh, modeling, truly an expert, together with Bogdan Zaha from Zaha Architects, who also started uh, in Minku and then left in the second year, I think. I think. Anyway, we're moving forward. Uh, I think uh, my presentation now ends. I have another presentation. I was myself in the bus leaving Vienna. So we see the building by Günther Domenig as I saw it from the bus uh, leaving Vienna. This was a short um, introduction, so to speak, in, uh, in this subject, Rebellious Vienna. But we started with Hans Hollein, who himself showed signs of uh, rebelliousness. And then we saw the rebelliousness of Günther Domenig and Wolf Briggs. And uh, my uh, inexpensive camera shows its uh, price, so to speak, here. Thank you. Ah, no, since I arrived here, let me show you. I didn't know that I have in this presentation because I talked about Brinkush. And I want to show you a project done by a group from Vienna Matthias Del Campo and Sandra Menninger, a good number of years ago, I, I launched a competition myself for a new museum for Constantin Brecouche in Paris. And they won, Matthias Del Campo and Sandra Menninger, uh, with an architecture group called SPAN. And you'll see their project. So again, it's a project for a Brecouche museum in Paris, replacing the museum that uh, Renzo Piano built which, in my opinion, is not truly really great. And that's why I launched the competition. You see here, they are both heads of the Vienna-based architecture firm SPAN. Anyway, um, and they, they proposed, um, unfortunately, let me see if I have, I'm not very happy with these pictures. I should have looked at, um, at these. Uh, but here we, you see something, you know, this is, this is the plan of the of the building. Can you believe it? You know, a very free form. 
uh, and uh, but but unfortunately the the resolution is unbearable. Um, I have other presentations with this. I'm sorry, uh, I, I didn't realize that this old presentation had uh, inadequate uh, inadequate uh, images. Yeah, but here you see better. This is the museum they proposed. And maybe you know the structure that Renzo Piano built. This is the Centre Georges Pompidou. Uh, and actually, uh, two years later, Span, meaning Matthias del Campo and Sandra Menninger, won the competition for the Austrian Pavilion in Shanghai. And they built it. And he sent me an email uh, thanking me for launching this competition because this project for Brinkush was, uh, uh, he said, the grandfather of the project uh, they did for uh, the Austrian Pavilion in Shanghai, which you can see on the web. If you just search Austrian Pavilion Shanghai, you can see it on, 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 on the web. Yeah, so th this is what they proposed. Uh, not a rectangular building at all. And uh, again, I'm sorry for the resolution of the pictures. I don't know what's going on here. Um, but you, you can still see something. In essence, this is the plan of the building. And this is the building uh, by Renzo Piano, Sir Richard Rogers, the Pompidou Center. This is not a good presentation. Uh, yeah, here you see the, the the roof of the plan of the of the museum and being composed uh, of fragments which which uh, are rigorously uh, uh, capable of uh, connecting with each other and and create the the, the wholeness of of the roof. Uh, you, here you see the sorry uh, you see the 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 site plan. Actually, the building becomes landscape and the landscape becomes the building. I'm not reading the text because it's a long text and the, the image is not very clear, but you'll still see something. Um, the tessellation system. Now you see better. Again, you cannot do something like this with the T-square and the rectangle. It's impossible. This kind of architecture can only be done using sophisticated technology. And you have to know how to manipulate it. Uh, to perspectives, um, you see the sculptures by Brunkusch. So this is another example of rebelliousness. Again, two young architects from Vienna propose this. And they propose this, why? Because they love the sculpture of Brunkusch and because they love architecture. This is the plan. Uh, this is the plan of the building. Uh, there is not obviously a rational system at all. Now this modeling maybe is not the, the best uh, illustration of the, the project, but um, these are the sections, in my opinion, a little bit too flat, the building. Uh, especially if you are to show the, as, as it, it, they are shown already, some uh, uh, endless columns, but because of the roofing, uh, they become uh, much less so-called endless. Anyway, uh, it, it, it was an attempt to, to create something that is uh, organic, uh, that is uh, free, that is cave-like, uh, and um, I think they succeeded to an extent. If the ceiling was not so low, it would have been much better, I think. I don't know why this is keep repeating the section. And the site plan here is the Centre Georges Pompidou. This is what they proposed. And this is the space in front of Centre Georges Pompidou. Ah, he, he wrote me, you see, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an email I received from him in 2011. The Brunkusch Museum by Spain is featured lengthily in the current issue of Abitare in Italy. In this publication, I'm discussing with Wolf Briggs 
and Mario Bellini, the concept of the project, best wishes and happy new year, Matias. And uh, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, here he wrote, he said, dear Dan, thanks for the kudos. We are almost done with the construction in China, in Shanghai. I told you the Austrian pavilion, check out the images I attach. Brinkush would be a some to build. Thanks for, to you and your competition we got. Uh, a lot of attention and the Brinkush is basically the grandfather of the Austrian pavilion in Shanghai in terms of concept. All the best, Matthias. Okay, that's it. So uh, today uh, we paid homage to uh, Hans Hollein and then we, we showed works by uh, uh, Wolf Prix and Günther Dominique and, and, and Spam. Uh, so that's it for today.